Okay. So once again, you all welcome to the second lecture in the SOAS uh, World Philosophies by Monthly Lecture Series. Uh, today we have the pleasure to listen to Dr. Ufo Shivasi. Uh, so I'll say, um, just give a brief introduction, introductory remark for uh, our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Ufo Shivasi is uh, a senior lecturer at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Pretoria. She is the uh, seventh president of the Philosophical Society of Southern Africa. And uh, her research interests uh, include personhood, part of which we'll be hearing about um, into this lecture, uh, personal uniqueness, um, themes of law, autonomy, uh, authenticity, death, and African ethics, as well as aspects of race and feminism. Uh, she has authored in these areas uh, several academic papers as well. And um, she's also worked on different inter interdisciplinary institutional projects at the University of Pretoria uh, that were mainly hosted by the Center for Human Rights. Uh, uh, Dr. Ufo Shivasi was a member of the Moralities Research Group at the Beirut University in Germany, where she was invited as a visiting scholar. Ufo holds uh, the 2018 Dean's Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Humanities Faculty and the 2019 Institute of People Management CEO's Excellence Awards, Award. She is also on the list of the 2019 Male and Guardian. 20 most influential young South African. So we are really pleased to have you with us today, uh, Dr. Mufo. Uh, before you begin your talk, just, just a little about um, the World Philosophies Program at SOAS. So um, the World Philosophies Program at SOAS um, is um, a philosophy program uh, that is primarily uh, concerned with a decolonial approach to doing philosophy. Um, so we have um, uh, a lot within our curriculum on uh, African philosophy, Indian philosophy, and other world philosophical traditions. So the, the goal is to uh, approach philosophy from a, a decolonial perspective, uh, which is why we organize this uh, lecture as part of uh, uh, as, as central to the way we approach philosophy within the World Philosophy Program here at SOAS. Um, the subject head for the World Philosophy Program is Dr. Sean uh, Hawthorne, uh, who is here, just waving us. And we have um, our colleague here too, uh, Dr. Andrew Hines. Uh, so with this team, uh, we are really doing our best to help students realize that philosophy isn't just um, a Western enterprise, definitely, but a global and um, world enterprise. And there's so much rich uh, traditional philosophy out there that we need to be aware of and we need to talk about and study about. Um, and today we'll find it uh, also very interesting to hear about concepts of personhood, particularly from the African perspective, as Dr. Ufo um, discusses her, uh, her paper. So uh, without wasting much time, we would like to now invite um, uh, Dr. Ufo uh, Shivase to please uh, uh, go ahead and present her paper, which is titled um, uh, Black Women Persons. You have our attention. Thank you so much, Elvis. Thank you for everybody here. Hello to all of you. And thank you, really, Elvis, Andrew, and Sean, for the invitation to come and speak at SOAS today. I, I really appreciate it. Um, my talk, I'd like to put it out there as a conversation starter. These are ideas that have been going on in my mind. And I think I was saying earlier to Andrew that um, they concretize as I think I have conversations with other people. So um, here it goes. Um, are black women persons? 
at first glance, that seems like a pretty straightforward question with a plain, plain spoken answer, which might read something like, yes, of course, black women are persons. While this might be metaphysically true, I think there is an enormous gap when it comes to the recognition of the moral worth of black women. I'm motivated to make this claim by the endless reports of the different forms of abuse that black women suffer in the South African society today. Incidents of gender-based violence and femicide have become such an abnormal norm, so much so that our own political leaders think it is enough to verbally reprimand the society and just take no further action to curb violence against women. More so, or at least, um, what's it? it? It's disheartening when we have fellow black women in influential positions like our minister, Angie Motecha, who would present say statements such as, um, educated black men don't rape. I often hear commentary at social gatherings about how much this is a problem, but hardly any work is done by our police services um, to, to stop this. This obviously disheartening as it increases the racial hierarchy in valuing um, that has not been done away with even in the apartheid, uh, although apartheid is done away with. There are several incidents that occur in society that make me wonder about the proper regard for the moral value of black women. These incidents move me to question whether black women are truly seen to have a status of personhood that affords them the dignity and respect. There are underreported cases of women suffering abuse in toxic work environments that exert violence on women in academic spaces. These forms of abuses, while not necessarily physical, they wreak havoc, havoc in the mental welfare of women. Systematically, women are generally an underrepresented group in professional spaces. Apart from being underrepresented, they're also underappreciated. And this can be seen in the problem of gender pay gaps and um, what's it, unequal uh, um, appointments. Black women often share experiences about the exclusion, inferiorization, and dispensability. Thinking about the experiences of Black women gave me the cause to consider whether academia can be exempt from discriminating against Black women, and um, I think not. To be brief, there are a few, there are different forms of abusive exclusions of Black women that form part of our everyday. These forms of exclusions are demeaning and they indicate, at least to me, a level of disregard that gnaws away at the value of black women. Black women in academia are not only exempt from this, um, are not exempt from these kinds of exclusions that, in, uh, that indicate the dispensability, inferiorization, and in many instances, an unjustified trust deficit. In this presentation, I'm interested to analyze the place of black women in society with the aim to understand their relegation to the position of knowledge consumers rather than knowledge producers. I hope to do this through the lens of personhood and test whether part of the problem is the lack of moral regard for black women, which results in the unwarranted trust deficit in their intellectual capacities that are res um, responded to by a muting of black female voices. I'll start by contextualizing the problem and then move on to illustrate the theories of personhood, especially the Kantian version of it and how it fails black women. Historically, women have been and continue to be racially and culturally discriminated against. Women in academia specifically have been relegated to the place of knowledge consumers rather than knowledge producers. When asking questions regarding who is in the classrooms and which scholars are being taught, we find that it is mainly works produced by men that dominate the academy. This gives a fallacious view that black women do not produce knowledge, black women cannot think. This view of black women as consumers is also evident in the positions given to women in the academe. It is mostly white women who fill up the senior lecturer positions, at least 46% in the South African higher education institutions with professorships held mainly by men, 71% in South African higher institutions. This indicates a low level of trust in the intellectual capabilities of black women, I mean women, particularly black women, which stands the development of black women as well as their contributions towards transforming scholarship and institutional cultures that hinder gender, class and racial equity. Gender inequality, Gender inequity in academia subverts the diversity and uncovers the problem of epistemic injustice in the form of credibility deficit that is built on stereotypes and prejudices. 
Moreover, these stereotypes and prejudices appear to be a matter of misrecognition, which is far more damning when an oppressive system moves individuals to internalize misrecognized identities that in the case of women can be said to be grounded in Iris Marion Young's five faces of oppression, namely exploitation, marginalization, powerlessness, cultural imperialism, and violence. My view is that these faces of oppression hinder considerations of diversity, which inadvertently have led to Black women not being acknowledged as competent scholars, teachers, and producers of knowledge. So why do I approach the issue of Black women as knowledge consumers instead of knowledge producers through the lens of personhood? Well, it goes back to Immanuel Kant. In a different paper where I address the uniqueness of women, I argue that it is difficult to speak about the identities of women, um, sorry, the identities that women foster as persons since it is unclear that they are uh, considered full-fledged persons. Their status as persons is important if we're to consider them responsible for themselves and others. In this particular paper, I blamed Kant for not theorizing appropriately about women so that we're able to view them as persons with dignity and to whom we owe respect. And I'll come back to this to say more about this in a moment. Personhood can be understood in the metaphysical and moral senses. And on the metaphysical view, personhood is generally a matter of displaying enough of a number of capabilities or capacities that grant human, um, humans personhood status. According to Michael Goodman, capacities include, but are not limited to, rationality, the ability for complex communication, consciousness, ability to take and reciprocate personal attitude towards another being, self-consciousness, the ability for self-motivated activity and freedom of the will. According to Goodman, we are to consider these conditions as necessary but not sufficient for moral personhood. While the above mentioned, um, sorry, yeah, okay, never mind. Personhood is generally discussed in descriptive or prescriptive terms. And Afro-communitarianism offers a view of personhood that is understood to differ from the dominant view of personhood presented by Kant. Kant's view of personhood differs from the personalist approach that aims to show that personhood is an, is an um, immortal aspect about humans that exalts their value above that of other species. Kant's view proposes the idea of persons as moral subjects whose personhood status involves moral and cultural education. Basically, Kant's view is that personhood is based on a certain, um, certain human capacity such as rationality. A person, according to Kant, is a rational being, and he champions the idea of rationality as a defining mark of personhood and places rationality as a requirement for the dignity. Full personhood status is only awarded to those who have the capacity for rationality. This way of thinking about persons is, in my view, exclusionary. It is common knowledge that Kant thought of women and children as beings who lacked this rational capacity. This is a view that I criticized, arguing that it places women and children outside the moral um, world, thus leaving them vulnerable to all sorts of moral violations. Moreover, such an exclusion prevents the society from holding women morally accountable for their actions. My concern follows the argument put forward by thinkers such as Susan Mola Oaken, who react against philosophers such as Plato and Kant, for relegating women so far outside the moral world that they render them amoral subjects over whom males can claim ownership among many other unacceptable entitlements. The level of dehumanization that stems from such an exclusion, an exclusion based on the, um, the capacity for rationality, stretches over um, to affect intersectional issues relating to gender, identity, mental health, sexuality, and more. There is a distinction that Kant makes that is worth noting, and this is namely the distinction between persons and things. The beings who exist, um, sorry, open quote, the beings whose existence rests not on our own will, but on nature nevertheless, have, if they are beings without reason, only a relative worth as means and are called things. Rational beings, by contrast, are called persons because their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves, that is, as something that may not be used merely as a means, hence to that extent limits all arbitrary choice." Close quote. This distinction is made based on value. We are to think of persons and things as substances with different values. 
where the value of persons exalts them above that of things and animals. In the realm of ends, everything has either a dignity or a price. What has a price is such that something can also be put in its place um, as its equivalent. By contrast, that which is elevated about price, above price and admits of no equivalent has dignity. That which refers to universal human inclinations and needs has a market price. And that which, sorry, even without presupposing any need is in accord with a certain taste and that is a satisfaction in the mere purposeless play of the powers of our minds an affective price. But that which constitutes the condition under which alone something can be an end in itself does not have merely a relative worth, and that is a price, but rather an inner worth, which is dignity. The value that persons have, which stems from their capacity for rationality, is dignity, which makes persons irreplaceable and incomparable. Contrary to persons, things have the value of a price, which makes them replaceable. Things, unlike persons, lack moral value. And for Kant, the praiseworthy uh, response is to value persons, and that is their dignity, through respect. This is an important distinction to note since it complicates personhood in terms of what women and children are, since Kant does not recognize them as having the capacity for rationality, and so are not persons. In defending Kant, Lucy Allais argues that women and children, according to Kant, are not automatically subject to moral violations simply because he thinks they lack rationality. Kant affords them a kind of special protection that makes them um, that makes moral care the responsibility of those with full personhood. Herein we're to understand women and children as moral patients. Arguing in favor of recognition of all persons in society. I, um, Heiki Ikahemo makes a similar assertion with the aim to show that um, the socially, politically, and mentally vulnerable should not be abused, but rather they should be protected by those who have embraced their esteem as co-authors of social norms in society. The main view is that there, we are responsible for each other, and so we should not take our privilege to marginalize and oppress others. Ikahemo's view differs from that um, given to us by Kant. Ikahemo does not depend, Ikahemo's view does not depend on individuals possessing rationality to deserve the same moral consideration. Kant's view does not protect the moral value of women and children directly, while Ikahemo's aims to do just that by placing an emphasis on dimensions of personhood that require recognition. The point I want to make here is that the idea that we should accept women and children as natural um, moral patients because of their gender and age respectively is, more is morally unacceptable and it does not emancipate them from discrimination. Charles Mills offers a different category that has the potential to help us understand the logic of Kant's personhood as neither categorizing women as persons or th nor things. Mills, introdu Mills introduces the idea of subpersons. Although he creates this category in relation to the subpersonhood of black people, it does apply to black women as well. Mill's view is that Kant designed personhood to account for white people, hence it was okay for black people to be owned as slaves. What makes the category of subpersons accommodating to women and children is that it is a category that sits between personhood and non-personhood. Women and children are characterized as neither persons nor things or animals. And so they fit into Mill's view of them as subpersons. Much like Mill's, I do not find this category mor morally acceptable as it privileges gender discrimination and ageism. At this point, I want to share an analysis on how Kant's theory of personhood is in general dehumanizing towards black people. I will share sections from a chapter I contributed to a book which is titled Toward an African Political Theory of um, Political Philosophy of Needs. Herein, my aim is to show the place and impact of theories, particularly theories of personhood, on exclusion and other forms of discrimination. My aim is to show that theories are not innocent tools. I want to implicate them on social and political problems with the ultimate aim to show that the failure to recognize black women as knowledge producers is not a problem that stems from nowhere. There are different criteria that seem to matter when it comes to the mechanisms of discrimination. These include, but are not limited to class, race, gender, sexuality, religion, and more. 
I think personhood should be added to this list of criteria for discrimination. I understand discrimination that dehumanizes individuals as an aspect of human experience, where in Michael Clifford asserts that human experience is a matter of three axes, namely knowledge, power, and ethics. I think personhood is a good topic from which to analyze the damage that comes with Kant's race theory and its implications for the personhood of Black people, wherein such implication is an undervaluing of Black people's basic needs. The Kantian view of personhood is offensive on at least two accounts. The first is a matter of race and the other is a matter of gender. Both race and gender, as stated earlier, are relevant criteria for discrimination, which ultimately hinder the fair and just distribution of goods and values when responding to needs of people in, in, in society. For the moment, let me discuss Kant's racial offense on his conception of personhood. I'll start by explaining the theory and then illustrate how it is offensive to black people. According to Kant, this, this is gonna sound a bit repetitive, but according to Kant, a person is a rational being with a rational capacity. Rational capacity makes a person, with, um, makes a, person a being with moral worth. It is this moral worth that gives the value of dignity. Dignity exalts the value of persons above price, where price is understood to make it possible for things to be interchangeable in the same way that objects are. The value of dignity makes persons irreplaceable and incomparable, unlike objects, or if we were to, fo if we were to follow Kant's logic, animals. Kant argues that the correct way to respond to a person's dignity is with respect, and that is to say, harming or violating the well-being of a person is considered immoral and thus unacceptable. It follows that those who lack the capacity for rationality are non-persons. It may serve you well to keep in mind that Kant's aim in his theory of persons is to uncover what makes persons more valuable than non-persons. His view is that persons are more valuable than animals because persons have dignity, a value that animals lack. Given that this rationality is, um, that, given that it is rationality that gives persons dignity, this claim makes rationality an atomic feature that determines the difference between persons, animals and persons, where persons are moral beings with the value of dignity instead of interchangeable price. In short, rationality stands out in Kant's view as the distinguishing aspect between animals and persons. Furthermore, it is rationality that makes persons educable. Kant understands persons to be innately corruptible, and he thinks it is the moral education that saves, that will save persons from their natural corruptible state. In order to master moral education, persons have to overcome their egocentric delusions of self-love. He claims that self-love and moral law cannot be on par with each other. He insists that self-love and the related inclinations must be subordinated to the moral law as it is the job of moral law to correct self-love and its tendency to deceive persons into thinking that they act impartially with the view that the interests of other persons in their community are equal to their own. This appears in Kant's writing as follows, open quote. We find our nature as sensuous beings so characterized that the material of the faculty of desire of objects of inclinations first presses upon us. And we find our pathologically determined self, although by its maxims, it is wholly incapable of giving universal laws, striving to give its pretensions priority and to make them acceptable at, as first and original claims, just as if it were our entire self. This propensity to make subjective the determining ground of the will in the general can be called self-love. When it makes itself legislative and an unconditional practical principle, it can be called self-conceit." Kant's view is that we, we delude ourselves into thinking that the principle of self-love can bring about morally valuable outcomes. He maintains that it is only uh, principles of moral law that maintain the uh, moral world that matter in the moral world. The outcomes of such of actions born of our freedom are morally relevant and those born of our sensuous nature are not. This idea of actions motivated by inclinations lacking in moral worth is also discussed in his groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. Here he argues that moral acts are those that are done from the motive of duty. The motive of duty requires autonomy, which one can only arrive at through rationality. 
Here in Kant uses rationality to distinguish between morally worthy actions and actions that lack moral worth. He does this by means of showing how autonomy is instrumental in the world, in the moral world. In doing so, he connects personhood with autonomy so that a person is understood as a rational being who's directed by autonomy to oblige to the principle of duty. Rationality then is not only the seat of personhood, it is also that which gives those their actions, um, that gives actions their moral worth. Understood in this way, the fate of non-persons lies outside the considerations inherent within the moral world. If you exist as a person, the fact of lacking <clears throat> Sorry, as a non-person, the fact of lacking the value of dignity by virtue of not having the capacity for reason leaves you vulnerable to all sorts of immoral acts. In other words, actions exerted upon non-persons cannot be said to be morally blameworthy or praiseworthy, since non-persons are thought to lack moral worth. It is this status of non-persons that Emmanuel Eze argues Black people are relegated to in Kant's work. Eze illustrates the racial discrimination that is embedded in Kant's ideas. Eze argues that Kant's racial taxonomy is racist and it uh, champions the view that Black people are an inferior people because they lack the capacity for rationality. Apart from its deplorable claim, Kant's racial taxonomy is quite, primitive, is quite a primitive view of Black individuals. The discrimination against them is based on the fact of their dark pigmentation. They lack this capacity for rationality because of their dark pigmentation. In other words, black people lack rationality because they are non-Europeans. Eze's analysis of Kant's work asserts three arguments that Kant makes that turn out to exclude black people from the category of persons, ultimately rendering them lacking things, lacking in agency and moral value. Eze asserts that, that Kant's view aims to illustrate black, that black people um, have no rationality, are replaceable because they lack uh, dignity, and so their value is that of price. And lastly, that they are not moral. Each of these claims has implications that are detrimental to the moral and political status of black beings. The first claim about the lack of rationality involves the idea that the capacity for rationality is natural. One is supposedly born with it. Kant calls this a natural talent, a natural gift. And his view is that black people are not favored by nature as nature did not endow them with this gift of rationality. Kant's logic implies that rationality is physiologically determined, is a physiologically determined aspect about persons. He defends his claim by arguing that black people do not possess rationality because they are non-European. By virtue of not giving, having rationality, then black people are not educable. That is to say, black people have no rational, uh, rationally valuable intelligence. They are capable of learning and dare I say, they're incapable of, of learning and dare I say, creating knowledge. This idea that black people cannot learn or create knowledge has over the centuries enabled the erasure of African knowledge systems. It is this very contemptible idea that black people have no rationality that thinkers such as Mabo Homore and Mohobe Ramose have tried to dispel. The, idea, the danger of the statement has shown its influence in academic disciplines such as philosophy where African philosophy was not recognized as philosophy proper. This was not because Africa has no knowledge systems. This was because of the belief that Africans lack rationality and so they cannot create knowledge. The assumption here is obviously that it is only Europeans who can create knowledge. Ramosa blames Aristotle's assertion that man is a rational animal for the exclusion of African philosophy and Africans learning and practicing philosophy. Ramosa identifies rationality as the aspect about humanity that has been, sorry, that has been used to maintain elitist principles in philosophy. His conclusion is that this assumption that philosophy cannot be learned and taught by Africans is in itself a crime against philosophy since the discipline of philosophy is about wisdom in general and not wisdom from one continent. As a second charge against Kant, which is black people do not have the, do not have the value of dignity and are re thus replaceable, implies that the moral worth of black people is tantamount to that of things that can be owned, discarded and replaced. 
This is quite worrying since in his groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, Kant argues that it is none persons who lack the value of dignity. Herein dignity is to be understood as the value that exalts the worth of persons above that of animals and objects. We are to understand anything that is classified as non-persons to be interchangeable in the same way that we think of objects being interchangeable and replaceable. By interpretation, non-persons cannot be considered irreplaceable because they cannot be, but they can be bought. Think of houses, food, and other objects in the world that have a price. These things are manufactured in numbers, and so if you lose one or break one today, you can, in most cases, buy another one to replace it the next day. Unlike persons with dignity, objects of price and are replaceable and comparable. On the contrary, persons have dignity, and the correct response to uh, persons is respect. This idea of dignity um, of persons is supported by one formulation of his categorical imperative, which calls upon individuals to refrain from treating persons instrumentally, but rather to treat them as ends in themselves. This imperative applies only to persons. It is designed to protect the dignity of persons. A person is expected to live a life that prevents one from harming oneself and others. Thus, the respect owed to persons is not the kind that only others must show the person, but the person in question is expected to also treat him or herself with respect. One is not allowed to harm oneself, nor is an individual allowed to harm others. According to Charles Mills, the categorical imperative would, apply, would not apply to Black persons, thereby limiting their value, uh, limiting the value of dignity um, to capturing only the moral value of white persons. Furthermore, the third assertion that black persons um, lack morality follows logically from his ideas about personhood, from Kant's ideas about personhood and dignity. Kant thinks that it is, rational, it is rationality that gives people the value of dignity and affords them um, moral value. It follows then that if one lacks rationality, one lacks moral worth. Eze argues that what Kant says about black people does not even give them the status of a moral patient. The view portrays black people as incapable of moral actions as well as lacking in moral worth. It makes sense that Kant would not find anything wrong with prescribing that black people should be whipped till they bleed if one is to teach them anything at all. Apart from violating one's well being, it is quite dehumanizing in the sense that it strips black humans of moral value, which protects them from kinds of abuses, which is meant to protect them. And this is inc incompatible with the social and political aim to respond to individuals fairly. The assertions that Kant makes preclude black people from learning and creating knowledge, from receiving recognition and respect as persons, and from participating in the society as moral agents or patients who can become co-authorities of the norms that guide the society. One way, of understand, one way to understand his view, um, this is Kant, is that because black people have no rationality, they're unable to learn anything even moral principles, and that they cannot, they are not worthy of respect and can thus be appreciated only for their instrumental value since they lack dignity. Black people are not persons. Put differently, Kant devalues black bodies to the point of dehumanizing them as he strips them of any value that would empower them to judge others as morally blameworthy or praiseworthy. Kant's exclusion of black people from the moral world denies black people proper humanitarian consideration. Naturally, it is not all thinkers who agree with Eze's view that Kant was racist in his work. Thomas Hill and Bernard Boxall defend Kant's, um, Kant against the charge that he was a racist. One of their arguments is that Kant was not a racist, he simply adopted the prejudices of his time, that is, the Enlightenment period. They assert that what we can glean from this is that Kant underestimated the strong influence of inclinations when individuals consider what, it, what is permissible and impermissible. Kant champions the idea that we should overcome inclinations as they interfere with acting rightly. When acting rightly, it is our moral strength that should guide us to act right, not our desires, emotions, or attitudes. He considers overcoming inclinations and desires to be relatively easy, open quote. Thus in the moral cognition of common human reason, we have 
attained to its principle, which it is, which it obviously does not think abstractly in such a universal form, but actually has always before its eyes and uses its standard of judgment. It would be easy here to show how with the with this compass in its hand, it knows its way around very well in all cases that come before it, how to distinguish what is good, what is evil, what conforms to duty or is contrary to duty, if without teaching it, it at least um, in the least new thing. One only makes it aware of its own principle as Socrates did, and thus that it's, 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 it needs no science and philosophy to know what one has to do in order to be honest, good, or indeed even wise and virtuous." Close quote. It would appear that in overestimating rationality, Kant took the strength of inclinations and desires for granted. At least this is what Boxall and Hill would like to argue. But there is something hypocritical in Kant championing rationality and then excluding Black people from personhood based on his prejudices, which are themselves a matter of inclinations. Kant's own theory about the primacy of rationality is itself not based on rationality. The prejudice against Black people is what motivates him to argue that Black people are not persons. His prejudice is not a matter of rational judgment. Given that his moral uh, theory prompts us to act rightly and that acting rightly is a matter of moral strength, then one can say that Kant failed to act morally in judging Black people as non-persons. Granted, identifying right from wrong is not an easy matter and Kant himself, himself seems to have failed to get it right. Hill and Boxall, further, uh, their further argument in defense of Kant is that those who consider Kant a racist have simply not considered his larger body of work and have isolated one part of his work to muddy the rest of his canon. They find it hypocritical to want to dismiss Kant because of the racial prejudice found in his work. Their view is that Kant is not a racist and neither is his work. They argue that Kant's work actually provides a framework for morality that applies to all human beings, that we should consult his framework to fight racism in our societies instead of accusing Kant of being a racist. Here in one is to believe that Kant's racism is based on the implications of what he writes, but that the deeper principle in his work itself is not racist. Racist. Hill and Boxall submit that Kant had racial prejudice, but urge critics to separate the thinker from his work because Kant's prejudice was not part of his central philosophy. The overall suggestion made in defense of Kant requires critics of Kant to simply accept Kant's ignorance and how it endorsed or supported the racial views or attitudes without affecting the core of his moral philosophy. My view here is that Kant constructs a race theory that is based on the idea that black people are inferior. And according to Robert Bernasconi, he's even credited for giving philosophy the first systematic writings on race. The fact that Kant is um, credited for creating the first philosophical theory of race nullifies the charge that racial discrimination is not an important part of his work. Following the place of, um, of his race theory in philosophy, one can argue that the principle of universalism that he champions in his work is that a particularized form of, uh, of, of universalism that excludes Blacks from the category of human beings, qua rational beings. In other words, Kant's universalism is a kind of universalism that does not recognize Black people as persons, or as Mills mildly puts it, sabotages itself in contradictions. Kant's defenders call upon one to consider Kant's work in totality in order to save him from the racist and sexist accusations. However, I'm not sure why Kant's work deserves such courtesy when it is written in acquiescence to a stereotypical and prejudicial view that non-Europeans in order to, about non-Europeans, in order to denigrate their moral worth, intelligence, and character. The things about the above mentioned defense is that it glosses over the fact that Kant tried to universalize a theory that discriminates against a group of people without a rational basis. Not that a rational basis would make it morally acceptable, but his defenders would at least be able to argue that it meets his own rational standards of scrutiny. It is not the charge of racism that is hypocritical. It is this defense of it that is hypocritical as it urges us to preserve the fruit of a poisonous tree, so to speak. The arguments advocate the brilliance of Kant's work and let him off the hook for his racial prejudices. 
What makes what seems to be prioritized here is Kant's body of work over its devastating racial implications that it holds for Black people. It is as though the brilliance of Kant's work is more sacred in comparison to the value and by extension the needs of Black people. I think that Kant's defenders find it more devastating to question the racism in Kant's work because the unity of the body of his work might not fully survive the charge of racism. He builds his egalitarian and inclusivist, inclusivist moral and political ideas on rationality. Yet he states that certain people, that is black people lack such rationality. The implication here is that all that is moral, all that is good, all that is right, matters only when we're speaking about Europeans. This implies that Kant's work is designed to explain the superiority of Europeans and their moral worth, intelligence, and their character. Perhaps the problem here is the overly inflated centrality of rationality. If rationality were to be removed from the pedestal that it makes, um, that makes it the marker of moral worth and intelligence, then perhaps there would be a sense of inclusion in the moral community that would be of no offense to black people. However, the real issue here may be Kant's irrational application of rationality as a tool to exclude black people. Black people are not irrational. And so it is irrational and morally deplorable for Kant to imply that they are. In an effort to find a compromise, Thomas and Boxall argue that the idea that the solutions to the problems of racism in Kant's work should not involve abandoning rationality as that would be like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They say, open quote, it is reason that led us to appreciate that the emotions, passions and attitudes can distort the results of reason's efforts to determine what is right. And it is reason that has led us to see that rational self-examination alone may not always enable us to bring all the morally relevant facts vividly before us. Finally, it is reason that will enable us to solve the problem, which in general is to find some way to bring morally relevant facts before common human reason." Close quote. The recommendation from Hill and Boxall involves not abandoning reason as a solution to racial discrimination um, that depends on reason. Although the problem may lie with the role given to reason in Kant's work, the solution is not to rid his work of reason. This anxiety about letting reason go is, an understand is understandable since the reason, or yeah, since reason is the bedrock of Kant's central philosophy. It may be greatly weakened without the idea of rationality. One can understand this, however, to suggest the prioritization of a theory over the value of persons seems irresponsible. Rereading major texts allows for different interpretations and these interpretations and their implications should not be precluded due to the fear that the reinterpretations could be damning to the theory. I reject Hill and Boxall's recommendation that we should disregard the charge of racism against Kant because his attitude towards non-Europeans is not central to the core of his theory and that we should look to Kant's reason to resolve the problem that is brought about by the prioritization of reason. Here I follow Charles Mills who argues that we should not accept and teach sanitized versions of theories as they often present misconceptions of West, um, uh, sorry, as they present conceptions of West political, Western political theories such as liberalism, humanism, and egalitarianism as racially inclusive and without contradictions, which is not the case. Open quote, political struggles around race, conquest, slavery, imperialism, col colonization, segregation, the battles for abolition, independence, self-governance, equal rights, first-class citizenship, the movements of Aboriginal peoples, slaves, colonial populations, Black Americans, and other subordinated people of color. The texts of all, and the texts of all these movements vanish into a conceptual abyss papered over by the seemingly minor, but actually tremendously question-begging assumption that all humans are and have been recognized as equal persons. Close quote. Boxell and Hill suggest that we should endeavor to rebuild institutions and encourage dialogue among people with different views and urge those who feel superior to listen to their inferiors sympathetically. Open quote. Listening to others with different viewpoints, different emotions and attitudes, and consequently different blind spots is the beginning, but not enough. 
The confident and complacent do not listen sympathetically to those they feel to be their inferiors, even when they invite these inferiors to speak. Somehow we must design institutions that will help us to listen to others sympathetically." Close quote. I'll set aside the assumption that part of the solution in dealing with racism in Kant's work is expressed in positionalities of those who feel superior, who must listen to those whom they feel are inferior, as, kind, as this kind of expression, sorry, in some way, maintains the very binary created by Kant's racial taxonomy. What is useful here is the view that the problem of racism does not lie only with the theorists and those who defend him, but also with the institutions that do not challenge racial prejudices in the texts presented. Kant has recognized, or has been recognized as the philosopher who brought the theory of race into fruition. Therefore, the view that we have to consider Kant's work in its entirety to realize that it is not racist implies that we should read everything back to his racial theory. No, we cannot cherry pick and ignore texts that have damning uh, racial views, especially since Kant's racial theory, among many others, has had far reaching consequences that continue to plague black people in our society. The main reason for exploring Kant's moral theory has been to show that the type of personhood that he provides um, carries a danger of inferiorizing black people. In academia, in society, and in society in general, black women exist as victims of racial prejudice. While they're said to be considered full-fledged persons, there's evidence in academic spaces that indicates the general failure or refusal to recognize black women as full members of a moral community. This is most evident in exclusions as knowledge producers. Kristen Borgworld blames patriarchy for withholding the epistemic personhood of women. Borgworld understands the muting of women, not only in professional spaces, but in personal spaces too, as a great contributor to women's lack of self-trust. She argues that the muting of, the muting that occurs in these spaces leads to the women's cognitive deference, she writes, open quote. The patriarchal pressure and expectation for women to be selfless to always focus on caring for others and not themselves, creates a neglectful attitude towards women's happiness and well-being. More normatively, women have been treated with, lack, with a lack of respect and therefore unjustly. This lack of respect is why women do not trust their own judgment. Women's self-neglect and lack of self-care stems from their lack of self-trust brought on by the patriarchal oppression. Patriarchy silences women's voices, causing them causing women um, cognitive difference. If a woman does not trust her judgment, she cannot successfully assert those judgments. Either she does not trust that her thoughts are reasonable and dismisses them internally, or she communicates her thoughts with hesitation, causing others to doubt her. Patriarchy has a crippling effect on women's voices, causing self-distrust and, selfless, and selflessness in women." Close quote. Borgwild helps to create a link between respect and women's self-esteem, where self-esteem is understood as a recognitive attitude that one holds for oneself, but it can also be influenced by the way that others treat you. Although she does not address Black women directly, her view about silencing women is relevant to Black women. Add that to the dehumanizing logic of Kantian personhood for Black people. And it seems apparent that black women, by virtue of not being considered rational, are thus worse off in terms of lacking epistemic personhood. In this sense, black women are not only excluded from the moral world so that they are viewed mainly as moral patients, they're also excluded from contributing to knowledge. Bogwell's view is that without self-trust, there is no way that a woman can confidently contribute to the world as knowledge production begins with one trusting their ideas and judgments. Vogel's argument helps me to frame the epistemic oppression of black women. There is a sense in which rationality is used to maintain intellectual imperialism so that black scholarship becomes an anomaly. Questioning black personhood, uh, sorry, questioning the personhood of black people, not only cast doubt on their intellectual brilliance, but also their status as moral agents. Black women face many struggles in academia and yet they're expected to compete at an equal footing with their counterparts, including black males. The muting of black women of women voices is detrimental both personally and professionally. 
When women's voices are muted, what is being silenced is an expression of their own intelligence, their interests, their desires, and their needs. I see the muting of black women's voices, whether by their male, by males or fellow females, as an affront first to the women and secondly to the moral and intellectual communities. Muting the voices of black women renders their knowledge, um, which is informed by their experiences, unimportant and gives the inaccurate view that it is only male perspectives on humanities um, and all that surrounds it that is worthy of dissemination as the only truth. The point I'm trying to make here is that the lack, the lack of failure to or refusal to recognize the epistemic personhood of women is a double-edged sword that harms women, the academic community and society at large. Are black women persons? Naturally, I think they are. While this is indeed the case, my question remains, then why is it that black women's dignity continues to be undermined across different spaces, including academia? My hunch is that this is an issue not of the, sorry, this is, sorry. My hunch is that the issue is not the fact of their metaphysical or moral personhood, but rather recognition of it by others with whom they interact in society. Ika Hemo speaks about recognition in relation to full-fledged persons, and I would like to apply his logic to illustrate the significant role of recognition and personhood of women. Before I speak about Ika Hemo, allow me a brief moment to explain Arthur Leitinen's view that constitutes, which um, explains what constitutes a full-fledged person. Leitinen writes about personhood as a matter of capacities that ground normative value, the correct response to which is recognition of the individual's normative value by others in society. An individual's normative value is grounded in the person making capacities, the recognition of which includes the in that individual in the moral community. Here in Leitinen offers a view of a fully fledged, per, full fledged person as an interpersonal being whose capacities in isolation from society or interactions with others in society are not sufficient to account for one's normative value. Leisen is careful not to exclude those who are not yet adults, and so he makes provision for potential persons um, to account for humans who have inalienable rights but have yet to develop their moral consciousness so they can join the moral community. What is important to take from Leitinen is that being a full-fledged person is a matter of psychological and interpersonal aspects. Ikahemo maintains the combination, this um, combination of the theme of personhood being a personal and interpersonal process in his expression of recognition. Ikahema provides an interesting view of recognition as inclusion in personhood, wherein he captures the three dimensions of personhood, namely the axiological, the deontic, and the cooperative dimensions. The deontic dimension of personhood involves both psychological capacities and the inter interpersonal status that enable one to be a co-authority in norm administration and being respected by others as that co-authority respectively. Here, there's an assumption of equality among persons so that the norms that govern society are, are a collaborative aspect of humanity rather than an authoritarian interchange based on hierarchical um, arrangements that breed inferiorization. Further, there is an axiological dimension of personhood that is concerned with the values that persons recognize themselves um, in themselves and others. Ika Hema makes it clear that the development, the developing Developing into a person is a matter of personal and social aspects. Herein to see one's value makes sense in relation to how one relates to oneself before others express their value of their values of the person in question. In this sense, Ikahemo takes his cue from Harry Frankfurt, who looks in, in part into what it is that makes you value yourself and how others value you. In addition to how you value yourself as well as how others value you, Frankfurt inquires about how you value others and the reason for that, the reasons for that valuing. What Ika Hemut aims to reveal to us is that valuing is not a matter that is concretized only by the manner in which others perceive and recognize you, but that it involves a way in which uh, a person values herself. Such valuing, whether of oneself or others, invokes the capacity for loving where such loving is a matter of intrinsic valuing rather than instrumental valuing. 
Dehumanizing or the dehumanization of another individual involves a sense of entitlement that is founded on the view that one is superior to another. What is at play here in, is in part misrecognition and non-recognition. Misrecognition of one's personhood and the non-recognition of another individual's personhood. Misrecognition of one's personhood is evident in instances of subjugation when one overestimates or overly exerts one, what one considers to be one's power. Clifford following Foucault rightly points out that the power involved in every, there's power involved in every aspect of experience. Power corrupts relation, relationality when it is used to oppress others. Oppression denies people their humanity and it does so in systematic ways that gnaw at their dignity by means of subtracting the opportunities that grant them access to education, shelter, freedom, dignity, and other values of, of, of inclusion in participation in society as full humans. Oppressors directly and indirectly create a superficial hierarchy by identifying some social factor to discriminate against um, another person. These social factors vary from physiological aspects such as race and gender to spiritual ones such as religion, notwithstanding the linguistic aspects that relate to culture and tradition. The point is that dehumanization is a result of oppression that stems from discrimination, which presents as an assault on one's dignity, thereby diminishing one's capacity for freedom to participate in society as a full human being. The idea of dignity coupled with epistemic personhood is necessary to show the epistemic oppression of black women, which is most evident in their misrecognized placement as knowledge consumers. As a last word, I think we need to be careful with the theories that we teach and apply when trying to make sense of humanity. Loyalty to theories that discriminate in dehumanizing ways do not contribute to social reform. I am one to agree with Kwame Jeche, who argues that philosophical ideas, no matter how abstract they are, should be constructed and shared with the aim to, to contribute to social reform. When looking at theories of personhood, we grant that it is not the duty of theories to force people to follow their prescriptions. But what does that say about their failure to reform society? Should we simply accept that they are unable to account for the personhood of women? If so, what becomes of the function and significance of personhood theories when they seem not to address the moral value of women, black women in particular? using the freedom of the will of the people to defend this idea that black women and women in general being morally devalued in society. I'd like to end the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was um, a brilliant presentation. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ufo. We really benefited a lot from that. Um, I mean, it was really interesting, uh, particularly the way you um, draw attention to the fact that beyond uh, issues of race, gender, theories of personhood does play a crucial role in the criteria for discrimination. Thank you so much for that. Um, so. The, the floor is now open for questions. Uh, just raise your hand and um, we'll be happy to. So, uh, uh, sorry, you, you please excuse me if I do pronounce your name wrongly. Thozamile, <laughs> uh, yeah? Sorry. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, no, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, yes. That, that is actually the, word, the name. <laughs> okay, thank, um, you. thank you very much. Um, um, thank you also to Dr. Shiva um, for the perfect um, uh, presentation. Um, it is lovely to once again see you after seeing you from Forte. Um, my, I guess I, I, I've got some few questions, but then I'll try to limit them. Um, given that your topic, right? Um, I was quite interested, for, for instance, um, um, in the in the silence of Kant in your in your title, right? Um, as to why is that the case? 
um, that you, given the fact that it seems like the paper or I guess the presentation <clears throat> is more towards a critique of Kant's, um, Kant's theory of personhood, right? Um, but with that being said though, right? Um, even if then there's that uh, silence from Kant, but I'm also interested in your take, for instance, um, from African scholars, um, especially with the theory of personhood, right? How would they, or how do you see um, the conversations regarding, you know, uh, personhood in the sense, maybe, I don't know if you also, it depends as, as well as to how you would then mitigate this question of personhood in relations to women, right? Uh, or women's, uh, right? Uh, or female body subjects, right? Um, so my, my, my question then will be, what is your take? Or how do you see the conversations, you know, um, between JJ, you know, as there maybe, you know, up here, maybe my solo in terms of identity, you know, um, and in respect to, because some friends of mine would normally say that there's, there's a limit or in terms of their language as well, the language that is being used in understanding personhood or, uh, or identity or African personhood and identity, right? Where there's like a lack of, you know, the, 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 the inclusion or at least the language is not necessarily soothing or welcoming to the female, um, you know, their female counterparts, so to speak. So that, that for now, at least, let me just be straight there. Um, but if there's uh, some time, maybe I can also come in again. Thank you. Thank you, Sosa Um Dr. Mufo, you, you could respond to that while yes. we wait for the questions, yeah. Toza Mile, hi, hi once again. It's it's nice to meet you here. Um, thank you so much for your for your um for your questions and, and, and comments. Um I, with the first one, I'll admit I'm not fantastic with, with creating titles, whether to talks or to chapters or whatever the case may be. And I think I submitted the abstract for the talk before I completed the paper. So that's why I think. Um, there was no cant in, 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 the, in the title. Um, but I think it's a noteworthy comment for maybe, you know, when I revise the paper and so forth. I, I like your second question about um, the African voices in this uh, topic of personhood in relation to gender issues. And rightly so, you know, you've got the Menkitis, the Jechas, the Masolos on them who write about this. And in, 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 incidentally, um, the second half of the of the chapter that I uh, referred to speaks to that, and in that section, I show that we cannot level the charge of racism against the African Afro communitarian writers on personhood. Um, they present a theory that also seems to be gender neutral and inclusivist but they're actually not quite uh, gender neutral. And you get arguments from um, someone like Zintle Manzini. I can share that article with you um, after this. And she argues that uh, this, this theory discriminates against not just women, but queer folk as well, and people with disabilities. So she, she actually uses the um, Mankiti's exclusion of biological criteria as sufficient criteria for personhood to argue that ceremonies that celebrate rites of passage are actually heavily grounded in ideas of gender binaries that exclude women, intersexed people, and, um, and so forth. So the scholarship on the Afro-communitarian view of personhood has done well to respond to the racial issues that, that come from, for instance, Kantian work, but they have not, they, they don't seem to have done enough so far to address the issues of gender. And when you do sort of um, ask the question about, and I think um, Molefe, um, Mutsamae Molefe addresses this in one of his books. And what, what seems to be happening here is that there is a hiding behind the theory. So that the, the dominant, uh, or, or the most, yeah, the most dominant response when you are asking about how African philosophy or African view of personhood responds to issues of gender, part of what you get is that, well, it is not the job of a theory 
to make people behave in a particular way. The theory itself is gender neutral, but how it arrives to people and prescribes to people how they should behave, there is a disjuncture there. Um, but I think in, in, in short, there's not, I think, there's not enough that's been done. Um, the, the conversation is starting, the challenges are being posed to Afro-communitarian thinkers about the place of patriarchy. You know, you'd know, the Afro-communitarian the Afro -communitarian view of personhood is about um, social unity, harmony, the relationality among persons, like my personhood depends on how I treat you. So there's actually a, an expectation of moral perfectionism. And it is that moral perfectionism that then makes you a person, a good person. There's also an assumption that personhood is already automatically good. So if you're a person, it's really a judgment about you being a good human being who has perfected your moral um, stance in society. So the challenges are starting to arise as more and more of us are working on, on the Afro-communitarian view of personhood. But I think more has to be done to expand the discussion or the debates on commentary from Afro-communitarianism on gender. I hope that answers you, Tozami. That was an interesting response. Uh, thank you. Um, so we'll have Andrew Hines and then um, Beth Dean. Uh, after those two questions, then you respond again uh, before we take some other questions. So uh, Andrew first. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Shivase. Uh, I found that incredibly powerful and lucid, so thank you. Um, you kind of began to answer this at the end and, and you dealt with it a bit um, when you were critiquing Hill and it was at Boxall, is that right? Um, okay, yeah. Um, but I just wanted to kind of maybe clarify for myself, is, is the lack of being able to kind of affirmatively answer that question, are Black women persons, does that have to do with the criteria of rationality itself? Or is it the lack of the extension of rationality. And I was just thinking about this being aware that, you know, in international communities, international law, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that criteria of rationality is kind of enshrined in those key assumptions. And so I was just curious if you could talk a bit more about that distinction, that criteria of rationality versus its extension, because I thought you had some really interesting things to say that I wasn't able to quite wrap my head around. So thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Beth? Hello. Um, thank you for that, by the way. It was very, very interesting. Um, I was just wondering, and this might be one of those philosophical questions which doesn't have an answer, so sorry. Um, but you were talking about um, reason being the solution to um, racism, I guess. Um, but then, and how obviously Black women are excluded. Um, and my question is, how can we apply uh, our non-discriminatory definition of reason into what is necessarily like the white man's philosophy and language when they have a different definition of reason? How, how can there be any action? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, I'll start with yours, Andrew. I think it's a, that's such a good question. And I think I try to answer it in terms of the recognition and perhaps it speaks to the extension of rationality rather than the lack of rationality. So um, my thing is, it is not true that black women do not have rationality. It is not true that black people in general do not have rationality. Um, this is an issue of perception. They, there's a group of people who want to think that. And in my mind, this kind of thinking allows them or affords them certain privileges or certain powers that enable them then to oppress, marginalize, and keep a particular type of status quo. So in answering that question, it's not that they, they lack the rationality, it's that I think by extension, there's an extension of rationality in a sense that people refuse to recognize that because it serves a particular purpose. So here, the, 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 the um, limiting or the limited view of Black persons, Black women included, um, is one where 
it is useful. It is instrumental to those who oppress to keep these people at a certain level um, in society. It's beneficial to them, but it is not the metaphysical fact of black people that they lack rationality. And I think this leads into your, your question, Beth, which is you know, the differences in how people understand rationality. That today we might have a, a race neutral, gender neutral understanding of rationality. Whereas before, in the, for instance, with Kant, he purported a view that was not race neutral. I think the danger in that is, is how we then bring this to the classroom, how we bring this to the development of scholarship, how we bring this to debates about our current states now. We understand better, we know better, but we continue, and this is the, the hard part in relation to Kant, we continue to teach his view as if it's Senate, and this is what Charles Mills is, is fighting, that we, we need to stop teaching views as if they're sanitized views that come with equality, inclusion, and so forth. Because in the way that they were written, in the time that they were written, with the aim with which they were written, they were not egalitarian, um, inclusivist, and equal, and so forth. So, so I think the the you know your your question brings up the the very important question of how we use language, how we use words, and how we transpose ideas from different times to current times, and what the implications of that could be for our discussions. But yeah, I think um, you're very right to say it becomes complex when we have one word that is taken to mean something in a different time to where we are now. Thanks. Thank you uh, for those beautiful questions and the comments to uh from Dr. Shifesi. Uh, we'll now have um, Kio Mbebe and Ishmael as well. So Kio first and then Ishmael before you respond, Dr. Shifesi. Thank you, Dr. Sivasa, for your presentation. Um, I think the previous speaker, no, questioner, um, Ask something very similar to what I want to ask, but I'll exp expand on it for clarity. So which rationality is in question exactly? Do you want black people to be considered rational according to Kantian norms or to a different form of rationality or the accepted definition of rationality in any context, which would obviously put it in the danger of a hegemonical account of rationality? And how exactly are Black women unique in this respect from Black men in terms of how they're treated by Kantian norms in academia? Thank you. Ishma. Yeah, hi. So just building on what you're saying at the beginning of the Q&A about sort of Afro communitarianism and the need to kind of develop that um sort of in a slightly sort of parallel way but sort of related is there a need to sort of uh, take a more nuanced approach to sort of black philosophy in general one which kind of facilitates a less misogynistic sort of ideology i'm thinking maybe my example would be fanon's black skin white masks which is a, I mean, a great book, I think, but nevertheless, I feel you get the, the chapters, um, I think what they're called, the black man, the white woman, and the white woman and the black man. And I feel the, um, the latter of the two is far more sympathetic to the black individual than the former chapter. And so although I feel, yeah, it's a, similar to what you were saying about Kant is there a need when studying Fanon to then highlight this misogyny and its impact in his wider philosophy. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for your questions. Really good questions. Um, your, your question is multi-layered, right? So which rationality? Um, I think there we might be talking more about conceptual analysis, about what rationality is, what it means and so forth. But I don't think, and I say it in one of my paragraphs in, in the paper I presented that we actually should be questioning why rationality is the mark for humanity. Why do we have to uh, think of one aspect about humanity that marks persons? What is so important about rationality? What is so 
beautiful or unique or brilliant about rationality that makes it the mark. And I think for me, and I think I said it also in relation to someone else that it is not that black women don't have rationality. Um, it is just that in the way, if we want to understand personhood, and I think it is very important to ask about the personhood of, of black women and maybe even women in general, but for the purposes of my talk today, black women in particular, because there are so many atrocious things that happen in, in society that seem to put women, black women at the black back burner. And my inquiry is why? Why is it that women are always at the bottom of the, the, the barrel if it comes to things that are beneficial? Why is it that they are the ones with the highest statistics in South Africa when we talk about gender-based violence and femicide? Why is it that there aren't enough? I mean, we, if you look at our, uh, our own field, why is there not enough Black people in philosophy in South Africa? So what is it then about Black women that makes them so easy to exclude. And I think this is why I use the lens of personhood to try and understand. And it's just, it happens that the, the lens of personhood is based or founded on the idea of rationality. So it's, um, I, I wouldn't say it's which rationality for me, it's really just how do we make sense of what we are observing in society or how we can make sense of what's what we observe being done to black women in society, how, what theories are, 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 can be applicable? What theories can help us to understand why women are treated the way they are in society? In relation to black men, how are they different in black men in, 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 in academia? I think politically they have a bit more, and I think you see this even in our affirmative action hierarchy, you find that black women are really at the bottom. Why they're at the bottom, I cannot tell you, I don't know. But there is a sense in which there's something about the gender of women that makes them this target for not being taken seriously, for not being whatever. But even if we look at the way society is structured, and here I think I, I, I agree with Kristen Bogworld who says, we gotta look at patriarchy as one of the problems. And if we compare women, black women to black men, then somehow there's, there's an aspect of patriarchy that I think puts them at some advantage. I cannot uh, measure the ad advantage, but I think there is, in that sense, a way in which they get, um, what is this? They get, uh, 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 I don't know, um, less um, oppressed, if I can say that, in comparison to women in academia. Um, and then the, the, I, the, the question about the, 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 the need, and I hope I understood your question properly, is there a need to take a nuanced approach, you know, with the categories of black men, white woman, black woman, you know, I think about it differently. So I had a conversation with a, with a colleague the one time and we we're talking about this binary of black and white and why it comes out so strongly in, in, in society. And in South Africa, it's a very different um, 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 uh, political play field or ground. And so you have black, I mean, sorry, you've got white, and then you've got anything else that is non-white, you've got it as under the category of black. So it brings to question, because uh, we are, a, 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 what's it, a nation filled with different cultures, different races and so forth. So it brings into question why it is that the ethnicities or the thing, anything that matters in, that, in those terms is only captured in black and white. So in that sense, I think to be able to account for a nuanced view or a nuanced approach to humanity that does not limit the uh, binaries to simply black and white is a view that I would actually support. I think there's something about this black and white view that uh, muddies or that shades or throws a shade or overshadows everything else that's in between. And I think for the moment, um, the discourse forces us to continue talking in terms of race. Um, and, and, and there's a way in which the idea that we should not talk about race in these binary terms, um, is tantamount to a kind of, of, of ignorance of the real social problems, because it seems that a lot of the problems in societies are founded on this um, 
uh, discrimination of, 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 of different races. Um, and so in a way, while we want to maybe move apart or aside from it or move above it, um, we're stuck there because the reality of our everyday experiences are still determined or influenced by these racial categories. Interesting. Um, there was a question in the chat from Zander. Um, as I think it's, it's not just a question, it's an analysis as well. So I'll just try to uh, read the part that summarizes it. Um, it says, is the race that Black women face really so simple as saying that racists just think of Black people as less than persons? <clears throat> I would say that such a view cannot account for the racist uh, phenomenon against Black people and Black women that we see on our doorsteps. Take, for instance, Jacob Zuma's misogyny on, or the Zulu King's homophobia. Do they, like Kant, hold their prejudices simply because they believe women can't think like persons? Does discrimination that is almost exclusively faced by Black women, like so-called corrective rape, boil down to a simple question of perceived personal inferiority. Yeah, but it's pretty complex. So um, I guess you respond to that first before we take a few more questions. So. Thanks, Zander. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very good analysis you have there. And I think what you're asking me is, what grounds different forms of discrimination? And I'm not one to say that in every instance, uh, uh, it's always rationality that uh, grounds the, the, the form of discrimination. So in the, in the examples that you cite, I was trying to read the full comment, um, you know, in, in the misogyny, for instance, it, it could be that the issue there, let's use the idea of corrective rape. Corrective rape is such a violent form that a form, this form of, of, of treating another person that speaks to an entitlement over a woman's body that men think they can, first of all, that they understand what the correct gender or the correct sexuality is to the point that they see themselves as authorities over a woman's body to choose for women what kind of per, a partner, sexual partners they should have. Um, there's an entitlement that they, they can do as they wish with that woman's body, that because of their authoritarian view that they understand what is uh, uh, acceptable in terms of sexuality, that gives them the right to then do as they wish with a woman's body. I wouldn't say in that instance or in that uh, uh, event, what is at play is a discrimination based on rationality. That is a discrimination based on um, some type of hierarchy. Let's call it patriarchy, actually. So the foundation of different forms of of, of, of discrimination are based on different principles. And what I'm presenting today is not a, 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 a theory that covers all forms of discrimination. It's a theory that covers, or it's a view or a paper that covers one particular form that I find problematic in the Kantian view of personhood. I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, so let's hear from um, uh, Patrick Ben and Jonathan Doe. Uh, so after they ask their questions, then you respond before we take um, to Zamile again and Beth. Um, so Patrick Ben and Jonathan. Hello, is it my turn or is Patrick's now? It's, uh, okay, uh, Jonathan, you could go ahead. Um, then right. Patrick can ask us. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, greetings from Ghana. Hi. Okay, all right. So uh, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful presentation. I enjoy every aspect. Uh, what is actually striking for me is uh, what are the sort of things we are likely to miss if we focus on the Russian, uh, uh, Kantian 
um, idea of 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 reason about persons and and uh, what kind of um, justice or restorative measures that can be brought to bear to women and um, and then are we then forced to look at the biological conditions and account for these things in, in a way and is that also problematic because the circumstances that women um, have to struggle through you know have to be accounted for in a certain way to bring some form of justice so i'm wondering if you can uh, reflect on that a little bit for me thank you um patrick can, can you um ask your question now if you can hello can you hear me yeah sure you can hear me now. okay thank you i think i had a little network issue so first of all you the uh, my question comes with a bit of a uh, comment. Um, do black people really have uh, a moral obligation or some sort of necessity to prove their existential worth to brilliant racists like Immanuel Kant and his likes? I think when black people or people of uh, or non-European uh, uh, descent, for example, keep on engaging people like Immanuel Kant on trying to prove to him why black people are rational, why black people can reason, why they can create knowledge and all those stuffs. I think these proofs that black people are trying to offer is going to be uh, inevitably trying to fit into a certain Eurocentric structure that Kant himself and his uh, brilliant acolyte created. So what happens is by so doing, black people are not defining themselves as human beings, but they are defining themselves in a way that Europeans want them to define themselves. And I don't think that is a model for humanity. Humanity shouldn't be Eurocentric. Humanity should be centered around human beings of all race, irrespective of class, uh, region, or continent. So I think, is this not a form of what Jennifer Vest will call perverse dialogue mm -hmm. for us to be engaging in this kind of discussion of trying to prove ourselves what the Europeans in the first place? Is it necessary? That's basically my question. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, I'll start with Jonathan. Jonathan, your questions are, are really profound and I, I like you know, uh, them because they look into the very foundation of why we discuss these issues. So I'll start with the one about you know, the biological aspects of women and why we should actually be paying attention to them or even talking about or do we actually need to take them into account when we're doing this work? I think um, we, I'm not sure we can escape it. And, and, and part of the problem, I th part of the reason I think we can't escape it is because the very form of discrimination is bound to the women's body. So even if you think about um, the woman's body is not just the, 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 the foundation of discrimination, but it is also the object of, of, of violence when, when people want to express their entitlement over women. So, it is difficult for me to say, I see why maybe there's a benefit to not seeing women only as biological entities of a particular sex, but at the same time, how do we then respond to the issues that are brought about us where people use women's biology as a weapon? Um, so, so, so that goes to your first one. And the second one is what kind of justice can be brought to bear to women? I think that's a, a, a tough one also, because there are, of course, different approaches to responding to, 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 to um, justice or in, 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 what do you call it? Uh, bringing about justice for women. Um, but I think before we would, I could answer that question, um, I'd have to, we'd have to think as, as a community, as a moral community, we'd have to think about what counts as just for women? So we, we have justice, 
but do we have a view or is there a way in which we can understand justice in relation to women? And what would that justice look like? So what is just in relation to women? And how do we determine that whatever it is we, we, we consider, consider to be just in relation to women is indeed fair and, and equitable? Um, I think it, it's a tough topic, a tough issue about you know, justice for, for women and their, their biological appearance um, or their biological reality uh, and its place in, in discussions about justice. But I think before one answers that, we'd have to think about what is that justice in relation to women? Um, and would those theories of justice require us to look at them as um, uh, sexed beings? Um, Patrick, you know, I like your, your question very, very much. And uh, thank you for being here. Just for everybody, Patrick is, is, is a student in my department. Um, so um, the thing about, um, the question about do black people need to constantly remind uh, 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 the Europeans or white people that they're intelligent or you know, constantly justify their intelligence it, it, the, the, the simplest answer is no, we don't. We don't need to keep doing that. However, we exist in a society that is built on certain uh, theories. And here the role of theories is, is a dangerous one in my mind because it perpetuates views that we constantly have to um, argue against or dismiss or whatever the case may be because as I said in my paper, theories are not innocent tools. They, it's, it's like um, thinking that there's a victimless crime. There, is, there are victims to the theories that are perpetuated in the classrooms and so forth. And if you look at the development of history or the development of education in our country, um, it's only about seven years ago that people started talking or challenging philosophy to teach or take African philosophy seriously. It was about seven years ago that students started to challenge universities to teach um, theories of Africa by Africans. So in one sense, yes, black people don't have to constantly remind people that they're intelligent, but on the other, it is taking so, such a long time for people to understand or to even accept this. And it's in the theories, it's in the everyday treatment. If you look at what's happening in America, if you look at what's happening even in our own country in South Africa, it's proof that this brilliance that black people have is still not recognized, it's still not accepted, and it's still not um, strongly or commonly seen as, as part and parcel of our moral community. So for that reason, I think, yes, humanity is not Eurocentric. Yes, theories should not be Eurocentric, but we have to talk about these things because the damage done by the theories perpetuated from a particular century are still harming humanity today. Elvis, I think you're on mute. Uh, sorry. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, uh, there's Amelia and Beth. I think you're back with some new questions. So um, let's have you first. Uh, there's Amelia and then Beth. Uh, no, thank you very much, Doc. Um, well, I've got this question in mind, right? I mean, we, we've been talking about this um, and it kind of struck some chord in me, really. Um, this question of um, language, right? Um, and this question of language also and its influence to our own identities, right? Or how we ascribe ourselves or identify ourselves, right? Um, and also, I mean, coming from like a, um, a, a Tosa background, so to speak, right? I mean, if we look into our language to identifying people, for instance, based on their gender, you know, um, yes, now, obviously, there's like new terminologies that are being used for particular individuals, right, because of their sexuality and stuff like that. But, you know, the, the, the question, I guess, I'm more interested in, in what, it's one of um, Oyeronke's, um, you know, 
um, debates, right, concerning language and how therefore language constructs this understanding of how then we we are we we take this language, right, this Western language, and then we try by all means to identify ourselves through it to make sense of our own reality, right. And uh, you know, um, because I was you know um, supposed to do a, um, also a reading on introduction to philosophy, you know, I was introducing feminism as well, right? And while I was doing my own re um, readings, you know, um, I I found um, a paper which is also in in African Gender Studies by Oyerong, right? Um, there was this book, this chapter that I kind of liked, right? Decolonizing Feminism uh, by Marnia Lazarek, right? Um, there, she was also depicting this notion of, you know, um, the, the, the notion that, you know, Black women in the US always have this form of identifying themselves as colored women, right? Or women of color. And though not understanding it's, colonial you know manifestations in the one calling themselves a person of color and all sorts of things therefore it becomes this you know um you know perpetual you know, or perpetuation of colonialism in and of itself by virtue of identifying oneself in a particular language that also suppresses that person right so i was quite interested in seeing perhaps your 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 your, your ideas around that um, do you think perhaps, you know, women today, should they still identify themselves as African women, for instance, or should they rather reconstruct another understanding to understand their own selves? Because for instance, in Corsa, we would say there's no sort of um, male, female binaries between one, to identify one person, for instance, right? We only, um, categorize animals right um as inkunzi or imas then you know that that's a female uh, cow that's a you know, and all sorts of things but that is be that would be mostly basically on um on animals not to say though that these identity these identities or rather the bodies that you know different people do have also subject them to you know um oppression um, and sexism and all sorts of things, right? But I was just trying to to see your 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 thoughts around this question of language and how we then identify ourselves, but trying by all means to stay true to our own experiences and and trying this you know decolonial move in you know expressing ourselves nonetheless. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan Miller. Uh, Beth. Um, my question is about something you mentioned in the lecture um, that was basically uh, that sensuality is not regarded as morally relevant. And that made me think about um, the projection of sensuality onto the female subject and um, how that could be an indicator of a male repression and that obviously being taken the toll on women. Um, and that made me think about, oh, that would be really interesting to research and look into. But I was wondering if you think that actually is interesting or whether it's another example of how, for instance, in a court of law, female trauma is used as an indicator to destabilise their mental capacity, whereas male trauma is used as a tool to humanise them when they've actually broken the law. And as to whether feminist and intellectual um, intersectional scholars should actually bother to investigate the projection of sensuality onto women or whether that's actually just, it, it doesn't matter because the result is racism, sexism and humanizing um, the perpetrator doesn't actually address the problem. Interesting question there. Yeah, um, Thank you both for that question. Yo, Toza, Mile, the one about language, it's such a big, um, such a big one, because even when 
for instance, my experience about uh, language or the limitation of language was when I was trying to explain to my grand, my late grandmother that I'm studying philosophy and I was trying to, you know, I, I could capture it so perfectly in English. And then when I had to do it in Chivenda, I was like, hmm, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in that moment, I was trying to figure out, okay, is it, does it mean because philosophy there is a phrase for it in Chivenda. Uh, 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 is it about, um, does that, would that indicate that if there's no word in a particular language that captures the nature of something, does that mean it doesn't exist for that group of people? Um, or, you know, or do things exist and we try to, as we encounter them, we, we name them, right? And here, I think my feeling was language evolves. And as you experience new things, you try to make sense of them. And sometimes in a lot of African languages, there's an appropriation. Um, and I was, I was having this conversation with somebody just about a day or two ago about how sometimes we don't have a word for it. So if someone asked me in Chivana, what is philosophy? I could say, I'm the philosophy, which is really just an appropriation of the English and then using it in the vendor context. And I think what's interesting or what's fascinating here is the capturing of the human experience and how it is only language. And even in the metaphysical sense of, of, of personhood, uh, the ability to communicate, which, you know, complex communication, which in, in, in the works of personhood is not limited to just um, spoken word, but to actions too. So think about an experience where you meet someone who doesn't speak istrosa, but somehow with your, with, your, with your hands, with your facial expressions, you're able to express to them whether, you know, what you need or what you're looking for or where you wanna go if you need directions and so forth. So while there are historical um, uh, social experiences that in, encourage us to start talking in certain ways, um, there's still a way in which lang the evol evolution of language doesn't, doesn't always come as a, as a barrier between people. So when we're thinking about the, the use of the phrase or the word black in South Africa and in, in, in America, for instance, um, I'm very aware that in America, they talk about women of color. And so it reminds me, for instance, of, um, let's call it the beak of black, right? Which is more a matter of the, uh, internalization of inferiority rather than the, the pigmentation of your of your skin. So that black is not about whether you you are um, you, you are fairer or darker or whatever in pigmentation, but rather how you uh, see yourself in relation to 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 the white race actually, right? And in a way, when you say this is like a perpetuation of colonialism, if you look at it through the Biko lens, then you see how in fact it is, right? That you are taking this category and in using it, while we might change it from black to the phrase women of color to capture the very same thing, at the end of the day, there's something about maintaining the colonial powers. But at that time, I'm thinking, but what else, and maybe this speaks to the limitations of language. Should we create a new word instead of me talking or asking our black women persons, should I, should, we, should there be another word that captures black? But even if there is that other word, does black change because now we call it something else? Um, or, you know, so, so this is a very interesting one because it is true that we construct our reality using words. And sometimes we fail to transcend even the negative implications of that reality because we, we, we're trapped in using the same words that actually oppress rather than, um, rather than emancipate. Um, I don't have like a direct answer to that or, you know, but I think it is difficult, it is complex to capture our humanity, to capture our identities without using the words that are already in place uh, from the established um, uh, language forms. However, I do think that we should maintain the flexibility of language and allow it to evolve with time uh, so that it's more inclusive. And so we ought to start maybe using languages 
or language to include rather than exclude. Um, Beth, sensuality, um, that is such, you know, I think you've just exposed me to, a, to an interesting uh, a way of looking at the role of sensuality in, um, what do you call this? In, 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 in thinking about morality, the moral world, the re relationality among persons and the appearance, the very sort of ontology of women and what sensuality means when we try to understand the nature of women. And that I can, I can, I can tell you now, that's a very interesting question. So I have this thing and I always tell my students that um, in philosophy, Questioning is key, questioning is important. And when you question the sensuality of women in relation to their trauma and the outcome of recognition of that trauma from others, which turns them into a weaker sex, so to speak. But when we see the same issue in relation to men, there is a do you, I mean, there's a humanizing aspect to it. Then for me, there's already a problem. And I think that problem is one that is definitely worthy of, um, worthy of, of investigation. But just to explain how uh, Kant uses a uh, sensuous nature of humans, he doesn't mean it in, 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 in the way that we think of, um, we're talking about sensuality now. He's just talking about the, um, he tries to differentiate desires from, um, sorry, inclinations from rationality. And all he says is that anything that we do that is not motivated by, by rationality, which, uh, which, which gives rise to autonomy, lacks that moral, moral worth. So you, you, we, we think, so for him, rationality is something we think through, we understand. And once we understand it, we are called to duty to, to treat others well. But what you are introducing when you talk about sensuality is how the body, the inclinations actually complicate this process from thinking to living morally. So yeah, great. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think we've had a very um, brilliant discussion thus far. Uh, I'm, um, I'm presenting the keynote on personhood and healthcare uh, in June. And I'm sure I'm going to be playing the, the recorded lecture over and over again um, to steal some points. Um, um, yeah, I, I found it very interesting. Um, personally, I, I, I wanted to see if you could say a bit more about the, the issue of the politics of recognition, um, knowing fully where that, well, um, Black women are persons, but the issue isn't about the metaphysical or normative aspect of their personhood, but about the politics of recognition. Um, and that just brings to my mind what, how exactly can, the problem of recognition be dealt with um, because it's so, it permits the system, it permits society. Um, how can it be dealt with? Where do we start from basically? Um, yeah, any ideas, any thoughts you, you have on that? Right, so recognition for me is so important and um, I see some of my students are actually here and we, we've been working with the theme of recognition and it resonates so much with, with the individuals in society because it, and, and I think this is where I like Ikahemo's framing because he sees it as a two-way street. Um, but first the aspects he talks about are aspects in the person, so the psychological, and how from the psychological one is able to make sense of the social. But he also talks about the impact of the social on one psychological, so that the recognition is not just a one-way street of expecting others to recognize you, but you recognizing yourself as well. But with the way things are in society at the moment, there is a need to, to, to impose recognition to fix social ills, to fix social harms. Because what is most harmful to, to black bodies in general is the fact that they're not recognized as humans who feel pain, as humans who need protection, as humans who need to be respected, as humans who, you know. And when you talk about this, and this is another form of muting, right? Because when you talk about this and here the reception from, from our white counterparts needs to come uh, more openly is that 
once you start saying black people are in danger, black people are not morally valued, black people are this, the one of the immediate responses is, yeah, but I treat you well. I've never harmed you. I, I don't do this. And there I think is a clear indication of people having missed the systematic problem of recognition in society. It's not about the one person getting it right, is that the dominant view of a group of peoples is seen as inferior, but so that that inferiorization sometimes gets internalized, which is why Ika Hemo says we need to work on ourselves. Um, and, 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 and in part, it is from that recognition of of knowing that there's a problem, that we are motivated to act to fix it. But I think part of what goes wrong is when there are no conversations. We need those dialogues, but we need also those dialogues to, 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 to be centered around, what do you call it? Some altruistic attitude towards those that are saying they are suffering. Um, and an understanding of that suffering without wanting to impose one's judgment of whether it counts as suffering or not. So I think uh, the politics of recognition are, are very, I mean, even if you, what's his name? Um, Charles Taylor also writes on this and it's, 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 so, it's so important to valuing oneself and expecting others to value you uh, as a person who forms part of a moral community and most importantly is seen as a, an equal co-author of the norms that um, that govern the society. Well, we, we we really want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Shifazi. We've um, given a brilliant lecture. Uh, it has raised a lot of uh, questions and discourses, and I'm sure we've all benefited one way or the other from it. Um, of course, I'm sure if we call on you some other time um, here at SOAS, uh, you would honor our, our call and we'll still have the pleasure of working with you in the future. And I want to say thank you all for all those who uh, attended and for your beautiful questions and comments. And we look forward to seeing you in the next um, edition of the lecture, which will be on June 25th, the last Friday of June. Um, we're looking forward to that as we have yet another interesting guest speaker lined up for that as well. So um, at this point, I'll stop recording. Oh, and no, if Alvis, I know... Sorry, sorry Alvis. Yeah, sure, I please. Go ahead. Uh, those of you who have attended, if you would like to join our mailing list so that you get notification of our um, seminars, then please just um, email me. I'm just putting it in the chat now and I will make sure that you are included sorry, whoops, uh, in all of our mailings. We won't overwhelm you um, with them and we will of course protect your data. Um, so I'm having trouble typing it in and talking at the same time. So, uh, yes, nope. SH79 at source. Sorry, but is it okay? Yeah. Not working, that's what it is. So I believe we have Hamad Dabashi um, yeah. in, in our next um, session. So yeah. another provocative and interesting talk coming up. But um, thank you so much, Info, for a really fantastic um, conversation. Elvis didn't recognize that I was trying to ask a question. Oh, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> That's fine, we are quite out of time. And I mean, in any case, there's really nothing more to be said. It was so good. So thank you so, so, so much. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everybody for questions and comments. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to write such a beautiful paper. Really appreciate it.